Hello, Fast Fam. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Craig Lieberman, and I've been tinkering on cars since 1980. I've owned more than 40 cars in my life. Some were heroes, some were zeros. But never in my wildest dreams would I ever guess that three of my cars would go on to star in a motion picture franchise. My Supra, my GTR, and my Maxima all had starring roles in Universal's Fast and Furious movies. Over the next three years, I'd served Universal as a technical advisor. I helped choose the cars, procure the parts, oversee their builds, and support both production and post-production. I have some cool stories to tell about what it was like to build these cars and to work with the cast. I was there, on set, in the production meetings, working on cars, hanging with the actors, and consulting on post-production. So follow along as I tell the stories. Let's jump in. Hello everybody. This week we're going to talk about another hotly debated topic. Which car would have won the four-way race in the first Fast and Furious movie? To explain this effectively, we have to look at two scenarios. Which car would have won if the actual Hero 1 car raced as it was in real life? And number two, which car would have won if the cars had all of the mods that the movie made you believe that the cars had? The race consisted of four cars, Dom's RX-7, Brian's Eclipse, Danny Yamato's Honda Civic, and Edwin's Integra. Let's look at the specs of the actual Hero 1 cars. For each car we had in the movie, we had to build several copies to be used for stunts. These cars would be designated Hero 1, Hero 2, Stunt 1, Stunt 2, and so on. The Hero 1 car is the shiniest, prettiest, most fully equipped car that we had on set. In the case of this movie, nearly all the Hero 1 cars were rented from private owners and they all had a lengthy list of modifications. Dom's RX-7 was rented from Keith and Moto and had little more than some basic bolt-ons. The parts list reads like this, street ported 13B, twin stock sequential turbos, polished intake manifold, Apex Power FC with FC Commander, a Blitz blow-off valve, a Cosmo 20B fuel pump, dual Blitz SUS power air intakes, Custom air intake pipes, MSD6AL ignition box, 10mm MagnaCore spark plug wires, a Night Sports radiator, Blitz front mount intercooler kit, and an ACT clutch. Essentially all the car had was basic bolt-ons. Back in the day, getting rotaries to make big power meant a lot of work, a lot of tuning, and frequent changing of apex seals. Dom's RX-7 made about 300 horsepower to the wheels according to the real owner. That sounds about right given what mods he had. In stock form, the RX-7 weighed about 2,800 pounds. The 0-60 to 60 time in stock trim is rated about 4.9 seconds, and the quarter mile flies by in about 13.5 seconds. Top speed is electronically limited to 155 miles per hour, but let's assume he removed the rev limiter so maybe Dom's RX-7 could do a little over 160, maybe even a little more. The Hero 1 car, though, never had nitrous, but let's pretend it did as showed in the movie. With a fragile rotary motor already nearing its limits in this trim, Let's say for the sake of argument that the car that we used had a 75 horsepower Sneaky Pete nitrous system just as we showed in the movie. So maybe this Hero 1 car in real life could have dropped into the high 12s assuming he could get traction. For those of you who thought that Dom's RX-7 didn't exactly sound like an RX-7, you're not dreaming. As I've said in many videos before, the sounds for almost every car were heavily edited in the sound design portion of post-production. The sounds came from a mix of Toyota 1JZ and a bit of 2JZ. Other sound elements were added as well. Listen to this sound clip and see if it doesn't sound very similar to 1JZ. When we talk about Brian's Eclipse, it was basically a figment of Universal's imagination, at least with respect to what it had under the hood. The Hero 1 Eclipse was rented from John Lappet. This car was a naturally aspirated 420A Eclipse RS. It wasn't a GS, it wasn't a GST, and it wasn't an all-wheel drive GSX. In stock trim, the 420A Eclipse is no barn burner. A stock trim Eclipse RS model makes about 140 horsepower and the stats of the day said that it ran 0 to 60 in 9.8 seconds and the quarter mile eventually passes after 16.8 seconds. The theoretical top speed, assuming the electronic limiter was removed, would be about 137 miles per hour, which is limited by gear ratios and final drive ratio, among other things. The movie makes you believe this car had a big fat turbo on it, but it was all bullshit. In real life, the car had a cold air intake, a header, a couple of minor bolt-ons, and that was it. At best, this car made 140 horsepower out the wheels, and I'm being generous. 
none of the stunt cars had any performance mods at all, so keep that in mind. But, even if we pretend this car actually had a three-stage nitrous system, which it wouldn't have had because nobody puts three stages of nitrous on a car making 140 horsepower. In fact, you couldn't put more than about a 50 horsepower shot of nitrous on this motor because it would likely grenade. This is academic, of course, because in real life, the Eclipse never had the nitrous hooked up. The bottles that were in the trunk were just for show. Now let's talk about Danny Yamano's Civic. The car was a 1995 Honda Civic with a single overhead cam motor and a 5-speed. Other than a cold air intake and a cheap muffler, the motor was not modified at all. There was no nitrous, no turbo, no spoon engine, no spoon engines with Motec exhaust, nothing. Performance stats for a 95 Civic were less than impressive, but still competitive. 0 to 60 whizzes by after 9.0 seconds flat, and the quarter mile flashes by after 16.6 seconds. Last but not least, we have Edwin's Integra GSR. The real car rented from Bilco was in fact a GSR. In stock trim, these cars go 0 to 60 in about 7 seconds flat, and the quarter mile is covered in 15.3 seconds. Very respectable for the time. Again, the movie never shows or mentions any mods on Edwin's Integra, so we'll work off the numbers of the real car. The mods on the real car that were used as the Hero 1 car included some mild bolt-ons, so let's just say it could run the quarter mile in about 15 seconds flat. All of my conclusions here are based on the presumption that each car had similar traction problems at launch, and perhaps Brian's car more than the others because that's the way the producers portrayed it in the movie. My conclusions are also based on the presumption that the race was a quarter mile long. In actuality though, since the race lasted about two minutes and at 130 miles an hour, cars would be moving at 190 feet per second. That means they would have covered about 45,000 feet in total distance, which would have made this an 8.6 mile race. In an 8.6 mile race, each of the cars would have been bouncing off the rev limiter and top gear for several minutes, meaning whomever had the highest top speed would have won in an 8 mile race. To be brief, the conclusion seems obvious to anyone who knows anything about these cars. The Hero 1 RX-7 would have taken the other three contenders to Gapplebees, as they say in today's lingo. The Integra GSR would have finished second, Danny Yamato's Civic would have finished third, and Brian, even without the contrived motor problems you saw on screen, would have finished dead last. I'm sure people will also ask, what if the cars actually had the modifications that the movie suggested they had? It's impossible to have that discussion, though, since the movie mentions nothing about what's under the hood of any of the cars except Brian's Eclipse, so everyone is just left to speculate, right? Any argument, then, about who would have won with the mods that were never identified or mentioned is pointless because you can make up anything in your mind that you wanted to. I can tell you this, the scene was fun to watch, but it simply wasn't very realistic. Serious straight racers use drag radials or DOT cheater tires because stock low-profile tires, UHP ultra-high-performance summer tires, are the worst tire choice for a drag race. But perhaps my biggest objection to the scene was the danger to manifold sequence, a point that I argued against most vociferously. I suggested that they should instead show a bottle heater and a pressure gauge, and the bottle gauge could climb into the red zone. Anybody understands that green is good, red is bad. I thought that would have worked. The computer then could then show something like EGT temps climbing into the red or the turbo boost pressure going into the red. Again, red means bad. All of that would have been sufficient distraction to perhaps influence the outcome of the race and leave it in doubt. When I had this discussion with the director, Rob Cohen, he insisted that audiences simply wouldn't know any better. I still suggested that they change the words to caution over boost with the idea being that audiences that knew nothing about cars needed to know that the situation was critical. Why they chose the phrase danger to manifold, a term that 98% of people would have never heard is still frustrating to me. Ultimately, Brian's car pops a piston ring, busts a ring land, bends a valve, or who knows what, but the car is somehow still able to flee from the cops moments later. That made no sense to anybody. But as an advisor, I can only give advice. And don't even get me started on the floor pan gagging. In fact, all the technical areas could be a video on its own, and I'll get to that one of these days. So keep watching for more behind the scenes stories and factoids. In the meantime, thanks for watching, everybody. Please don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you next time.